this rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As Good morning. has been previously read, this morning's text for reflection comes to us from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 to 10. And if I may, once again, it reads like this. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by grace, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they are. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. The word of God. Let us pray. Great God of peace and mercy. We come before you this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. We have come this morning to thank you for your grace. That same saving grace for which you have now called us to persevere through the present pressures of this time. As we are called to persevere then, Lord, cause us, O oh God, not to lose sight of why we persevere. For the apostle declares, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Help us, therefore, Lord, to understand that it is through perseverance that we ultimately find peace with you. Being cognizant of the fact that troubles don't last always. So, Lord, we have gathered in your name this morning. May you use me. Use even me for your honor and for your glory. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, for you are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the book of First Corinthians opens by stating the author, who is the Apostle Paul. Paul called to be an apostle, says chapter 1 and verse 1, of Jesus Christ through the will of God 
and sustainest our brother unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Jesus, called to be saints. And so, brothers and sisters, chapter 1 tells us the authorship of 1 Corinthians, which is established to be that of Paul. Chapter 1 tells us the audience that is determined to be the people of Corinth. But most importantly, brothers and sisters, chapter 1 tells us that the appeal of this book is to them that are sanctified in Jesus and to them that are called to be saints. Friends, Paul has been on his evangelistic mission in Ephesus. And I believe if we are to contextualize what happened in our modern day society, Paul would have received an eye message from Chloe's house about the contention that has been happening amongst the brethren of the community. Paul then writes to the Corinthians to address this very same issue in chapters 1 to 4. He speaks of issues that has been happening in the church in chapters 5 to 10. Friends, he addresses worship and gifts of the Spirit in chapters 11 to 14. The matter of resurrection is raised in chapters 15. And then finally in chapter 16, he closes his first letter on the matter of collection of the saints and then shares with the Corinthians his travel itinerary and his closing remarks. For this morning's reflection, friends, our text is found in a section for which Paul discusses the matter of resurrection. Paul argues vigorously that there is no resurrection if Christ is not risen. In fact, if Christ is not risen, we are all dead. But not just dead to sin, but we are dead in sin. And so, brothers and sisters, the belief in the resurrection of Jesus the Christ becomes a necessary condition for one not to be dead in sin, but for one to be dead to sin. That is to have renounced sin and no longer needing to be controlled by it. As we then purposefully survey this particular pericope of Paul's letter to the Corinthians church in chapter 15, Paul provides us, brothers and sisters, with concrete evidence of Jesus and his resurrection in verses 5 to 8. By citing all the eyewitnesses which gave us hope and indeed tells us that there is hope for us to be dead to sin. But importantly, family of God, as Paul writes verses 9 to 10 of the Corinthians, and in particular, his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul strikes me as one who has come face to face with reality as he expresses his deep and sincere self-abasement. It is in Paul's phase of this letter for which 
I consider him entering a state of deep reflection. Paul enters a state of deep reflection, brothers and sisters. For it is in this reflective state that Paul receives an epiphany. For I am the least among the apostles, so much so that I am not even qualified to be called an apostle, declares Paul. And in this epiphany, brothers and sisters, Paul had a revelation of his self-identity. Paul had a revelation of his self-identity. I am the least of the apostles. I am the elachistos apostolis. I am the least of the least, the less than the least. Brothers and sisters, it is the same Paul who having studied at the feet of Gamaliel would have been acquired and would have acquired philosophical and intellectual prowess which would have secured his name in academia. It is the same Paul, brothers and sisters, who having been a citizen of Rome, would have in his possession a Roman passport, which would have secured his name amongst the affluent. It is, brothers and sisters, the same Paul who having been a member of the tribe of Benjamin would have secured his name amongst those to be admired. Yet, brothers and sisters, in this deep reflective state, Paul has declared, I am a nobody. I am insignificant. I am the little man. I have no claim to fame. And friends, I have come to the realization, declares Paul, that I am simply the least of the apostles. Brothers and sisters, you know, it is a frightening and a frighteningly lonely place to be when you have come to the realization that you are nobody without God. Where then would I be? Where would then you be if Jesus didn't love you? Where would I be if Jesus didn't care? Where would I be if he didn't sacrifice his life? Oh, but I'm glad. I'm so glad he did. Paul recognizes friends his own frailty in his identity and that he was nobody without Christ. As Paul remains in this deep reflective state, not only has he come to the revelation of his self-identity, but secondly, friends, Paul has come to the recognition of his serious infractions. I am the least amongst the apostles. I am not worthy to be an apostle. For I have persecuted the church of God. I am mindful of my infractions. Because though I have been forgiven of them and been called to the office, the office of the apostleship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every now and again, Paul says, I am flustered. Every now and again, Paul says, I receive flashbacks. Every now and again, Paul is reminded of how he 
fervently massacred, imprisoned, and caused the children of God to suffer in the name of God. For I know what I have done, says Paul. I need not to be reminded of it, for it tortures me night and day. I know my transgressions and my sins are before me. For against thee, O Lord, have I sinned. But this morning, I plead this morning, God, that you will purge us with Isop. You will blot out our transgression and create in us a clean heart, O Lord. Renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit away from us, but restore the joy of our salvation. Paul says, I have come to the revelation of my self-identity. I have recognized my serious infractions. But finally, friends, as Paul remains in this deep reflective state, he finds release in the grace, in the saving grace of the one who is ineffable. Paul finds release in the saving grace of the one who is ineffable. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed upon me. Not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. He found grace in the one who transcends human comprehension and language. Paul acknowledges his limitation, yet found himself in the presence of an incomprehensible divine grace that flooded his soul with peace that the world cannot give and peace that the world cannot take away. Paul's experience then, brothers and sisters, tells us that there is grace like no other. That is a supernatural transfer where the giver gives man gift for which he could have done nothing to gain. For by grace are he saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so friends, as Paul confesses to us this morning, the revelation of his self-identity, as he recognizes the seriousness of his infraction, and as he finds release in the one who is ineffable. What can we take away from this this morning? For though the writing is to Corinth, what are the applications to us in the Caribbean? What are the applications to us in the North American continent? What are the applications to us in neighboring countries and communities? What then can we glean from this? If we are saved by grace and saved to persevere, what must we take from this with our walk with God? I propose to you then, brothers and sisters, one, we must understand that it is the saving grace of God 
that helps us to persevere. And we must come to the place and point just like Paul, that after deep reflection, we must admit, brothers and sisters, that our works will not work. It is like Socrates to know thyself. It is to know, brothers and sisters, that I cannot persevere on my own. I cannot journey this life on my own works, for my works will not work. I labored, says Paul, more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. Like Paul, we must come to the conclusion of yet not I. What then gives us the impetus to persevere? What then gives us the strength to persevere? It is to know that it is not our works that cause us to persevere. But it is the grace that was with us. How many times, brothers and sisters, have we tried to fight our own battles? How many times, brothers and sisters, have we attempted to work our way out of situations? But this morning, God is reminding us that we are not the sources of our resources. And if we are to persevere, we must depend on God. For our works will not work. Not only must we come to the conclusion that our works will not work, brothers and sisters, but we must understand that our strength is not sufficient. We must understand that our strength is not sufficient. Yet not I, but the grace of God. It was the grace of God that enabled Paul. And it is, brothers and sisters, the grace of God that is enabling us even now. For his strength is made perfect in our weakness. It is his strength, not I, says Paul. For the battles we fight are not ours. For there are some problems only God can fix. There are some moments that just don't make sense. I have seen them time and time again. There are some problems only God can fix, not my battle, not my fight. <coughs> By the spirit of the living God. In persevering, friends, we must understand that our works will not work. We must understand, friends, that our strength is insufficient. But lastly, friends, we must, if we are to persevere through this prickly, sin-paced world, that we are called by God to embrace the grace of God that is germane to our walk with him. Grace is available for all brothers and sisters. The songwriter puts this, put it this way. The marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that extends our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There were the blood of the Lamb spilled. Grace, grace, 
God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair, like the sea waves cold, threatens the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, point to the refuge of the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, brothers and sisters, grace that is greater than all our sins. Marvelous infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see his face, will you this moment grace receive. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. It is for us, brothers and sisters, to embrace the grace of God that is germane to our walk with him. Friends, as we persevere, through the hot, the hostile, and the humid spiritual environments, we are called by God to embrace his grace because without his grace, we cannot persevere. We are called brothers and sisters to enter this reflective state like Paul of checking ourselves, knowing our self-identity. For in our self-identity, we will acknowledge that our works will not work. We are called, then, brothers and sisters, if we are to persevere, to reflect like Paul, on our serious infractions because these were the states where we were at our weakest. For we were yet susceptible to sin and we acknowledged that our strength was not sufficient. Like Paul, brothers and sisters, we must come to the state where we are cognizant of the fact that it is God who releases us in his marvelous grace. And through this then, we are called to embrace the grace of God which is integral to our walk with him. To them then that are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints, press along saints, press along in God's own way. Persecution we must face, trials and crosses in our way. But the hotter the battle, the sweeter the victory. In the name of our Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Amen and Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Sovereign God, we come before you this morning to thank you for your grace. The grace that has pardoned us time and time and time again. God, we thank you this morning for your word that we can reflect like Paul on our self-identity. We can reflect like Paul on our serious infractions. We can reflect like Paul that you provide sustaining grace. But above all else, God, we pray that we will come to the point and place where we accept that our works will not work, that we will accept that our strength is not sufficient, and that we will accept, O oh God, that your grace is needed for us to stand any chance at persevering this prickly, sin-paced world. We pray, O oh God, that you will strengthen us through your word this morning. That we will find comfort. We will find solace. That you will never leave nor forsake us. We will find peace in your grace to persevere. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen us for our journey ahead. Lord, for we know that difficult times are on the horizon. We know that trials remain on our track. Mm -hmm. But God, we know that with Christ in our vessel, mm -hmm. we can yet smile at the storms of life. Cover us then, Lord as we depart from this platform, but not, never from your presence. Keep our hearts and our minds steadfast on you. As we press along to our end date of this 40 day fast. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen us. We pray that you will equip us, O oh Lord, We pray that you will steady our focus on this fast. Lord, we pray that you will now have your own sweet divine way in with us and through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.